which obviously then the shower trap wasn't attached to anything. So then when the next person had the shower, it just flooded through and collapsed the ceiling below straight into the owner's wife's bathroom hair salon. If things aren't going wrong, maybe your systems aren't right to understand right exactly <laughs> what is going wrong. But even if they had just gone up slightly every year, they've still gone up. So the cash flow is going to be a lot more in five years time or 10 years time. And that's when I feel like it starts to really pay off in property. It's finding that balance with um, where to spend that money, whether it be on cars, obviously, for like yourself, <laughs> or whether it be on the marketing side of it. And the, but it's finding the balance, isn't it? If I look, that's probably one of the biggest things that I'd say has changed over the industry over the last six years. So if uh, anyone's got a builder in Brighton in 2019 that said they were <laughs> going to be there on a Saturday and never turned up, then Josh is the reason why. <laughs> <laughs>Welcome to another episode of the Property Developer Show, the podcast. Today, I'm joined by a good friend of mine, uh, Josh Guest. Josh runs a service accommodation business as well as a property investor himself, uh, based down in uh, the Midlands. And a uh, big warm welcome today. Uh, up, Travelled up to Liverpool from the Midlands. So thanks for coming <laughs> along, Josh. Welcome to the show. No worries. Thanks for having me on, Scott. Looking Ple forward to it. Pleasure. Uh, obviously, we knew each other through uh, said training company. And um, I suppose you were somewhat established already uh, before you attended that. I was kind of like, I suppose, just getting into being uh, my own business owner and sort of investing at the time. And I suppose it, I've kind of seen your business develop from what was good business at the time, absolutely, to uh, an even better business today. And it's going to be interesting to sort of delve into that a little bit more you know what headaches you've sort of faced during that process and uh, which i'm sure you've you've had plenty um but i suppose um i know your journey but for people at home who uh, who is josh guest yeah absolutely so yeah i started six years ago so uh 2018 in march um actually started to get into property a bit of a different way compared to most people so i actually purchased um a rent to SA business off somebody else. So they'd started it, had three properties in it, um, basically ran it for a year, gave up on that. Um, I wanted to get out and I basically found out about it through a friend because I wanted to start in property or in business. Um, and then basically got offered it, um, ran the numbers, thought I could get my money back out within six to 12 months. Um, thought it'd be a good investment instead of having the money in stocks and shares at the time. Um, so decided to basically take the business over from them, um, but didn't have a clue about service accommodation, property, business or anything really, because um, I just looked at the numbers and thought I could get my money back out in six or 12 months. <laughs> um, so kind of a bit naive, but just jumped into it for, I'll figure things out along the way. And how old were you at the time? 20 at the time. Right. Yeah. Um, had no systems in place because the previous person had put no systems in place. So everything was completely manual. Um, so if anyone's listening to this that runs a service combination business. Or any business. Um, or any business, yeah, <laughs> with lots of systems in place. Um, and yeah, we had zero in place. So literally, if we got a book in, come in, we'd, I'd block all the calendars manually. Um, we'd then send this cleaning schedule to the cleaners manually. Um Literally everything is completely a manual process. We take payments and everything all manually at the time. There's, there was no systems in place. Um, then I just started going on Facebook, doing a bit of research, um, connected with several people off there, listen to podcasts like this, um, started to get a bit more business knowledge, um, started to then speak to other people that are in the industry, uh, build up from there. And then... Also, the, this, these properties that are taken over were actually four hours from where I live. So they were in Brighton and I live in Worcester. Oh, wow. Um, so that was quite a big decision, scary situation anyway. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> um, especially for your first few properties. Um, and then I suddenly, well, I still lived in Worcester. So I thought, actually, there's a market for it here. Um, property works at virtually anywhere. Um so let's try and look for some more deals around locally to me. So started doing that and sort of built it up from there over the last six years. Makes sense. I mean, Brighton is a is a long way to go for um, particularly, 
I suppose, with no sort of prior experience. What, what, I suppose, what were the lessons that you learned in that in the in the very first? Because I mean, you're still here, you're still doing it today, so it mustn't have been that bad. But did you sort of, apart from obviously the system side of things, what other lessons did you sort of learn in that early stage? Um, yeah, so probably one of the biggest ones. Um, literally after three weeks of having those properties, we had um, a, a shower blocked. So we only had to call out an emergency plumber because we couldn't actually find a plumber. And it's in Brighton, obviously, where it's quite costly anyway to find a plumber. So calling out an emergency plumber, paying £400 just to unblock a shower, which mm. just had hair in. Mm. But the plumber went out and decided to use a plunger and actually popped the shower um, trap off. Um, which obviously then the shower trap wasn't attached to anything. So then when the next person had the shower, it just flooded through um, and collapsed the ceiling below straight into the owner's wife's um, bathroom hair salon. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've got no words. Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. So how um, did you deal with uh, that the aftermath? Yeah, that was literally after three weeks. So obviously... Also, I technically didn't really have any relationship with this landlord either because I just bought this business off mm, somebody. Of so I never actually built up the report with him in the first place. So he literally um, obviously called me, um, probably had a few F words in there as well. And um, obviously I had to make, make my way down to Brighton, which is four hours. He was like, get in now. And I'm like, well, I can't do too much. Um, the ceiling's obviously collapsed. Not ideal. Luckily, everyone was okay because somebody had actually just been in that bathroom below. Um, so luckily, didn't injure anyone. That's the main thing. And then I, um, uh, yeah, went down there. Um, this was a place that slept 12 people. So we had to relocate them. It cost me £3,000 for the first night. Um, it was going to cost me another £3,000 for the second night. But literally, I went down there. I was like, I've got to find a builder. Um straight away to obviously get this fixed and then obviously worry about doing an insurance claim after because it was this plumber's negligence because obviously he had popped off the shower mm -hmm. trap um so got all photos of that um called several builders around eventually got hold of somebody he said all right i could come now um have a look at it and then he was like i could come on monday and fix it and this was on like friday i was like well if you can come tomorrow on a saturday i'll just give you an extra 25 percent." and he was like yeah no problem i'll be here saturday and that was going to save me though another three thousand pounds on relocating those guests again. Um, so that was a big thing, big learning lesson. So I always recommend to people getting into whatever side of property, um, obviously property development, anything to stick within an hour of your location initially. Mm. Um, once you've learned the sort of ropes of property and everything and business, etc., then you can start going outside of that box if you wish to. But it's definitely, in, in my view, is to stay close to the home so you can obviously get to any of those issues because there is always going to be issues along the way. Wow. So if uh, anyone's got a builder in Brighton in 2019 that said they were <laughs> going to be there on a Saturday and never turned up, then Josh is the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a story. What a way to start the podcast, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez, and uh, do you know what? That's the reality of property. You know, things yeah. do go wrong and it's all about the solution that you find to those problems. And I suppose it's all about <laughs> how you react to, to those situations and and obviously it didn't deter you from where you are today because obviously you know some people might have had that situation and gone well i want nothing to do with this yes anymore so either uh, i suppose it was further naivety or you know what i suppose what is it that you think kept you coming back to the whole property piece um yeah no good question i think it was uh just a determination really of uh keep going and wanting to succeed so um it helped me actually learn a lot a lot of things a lot quicker as well actually so on a flip side of being further away i had to then put systems in place pretty rapidly um otherwise this stuff could happen again mm -hmm. um and then also it was, it was quite good obviously on that side of things of actually um going through like the legal process as well because i never thought i'd have to be trying to chase um like a legal claim against a a national plumbing firm um, to obviously for their negligence. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's quite good to uh, go through that sort of process as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. It's all about lessons, isn't it, I suppose? And yes. you definitely get a lot of that s through property. So I suppose fast forwarding then, so, you know, four, five, six years worth of, of growth, certainly from, from where you were, 
what has that sort of looked like in terms of, I suppose, uh, are, are you still operating in Brighton? Have you sort of brought operations closer to home? You know, what, what does that sort of look like in terms of that kind of setup now? Yeah, absolutely. So change the structure a little bit. So we don't actually have the original properties that we had in Brighton anymore, um, which were obviously rent to service accommodation properties. Um, we still do have some properties in Brighton, but we only manage those now. Um, and then basically any rent to SAs or own properties that are purchased, then I will only do those now within an hour of where I live. Right. Makes sense. And then in terms of sort of business growth, then obviously you went from just yourself to, yeah. I, I know you've got a team. So yeah. if you want to sort of delve into that sort of growth. Yeah. So we've got a team um, of about 10 people uh, directly employed by us, uh, which is sort of like, which I call like the core team, the core office team. Um, and then we've got a team of probably about 60 people, which includes more employed uh, maintenance and cleaners and also subcontractors of cleaners and maintenance teams. Mm. And I suppose going from just yourself to that kind of, you know, larger scale team and yeah. operationally, you know, yeah, you've got a core team of 10, but operationally you're probably managing 70, yes. 80 people. What's been, I suppose, the biggest growing pains with that kind of growth, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. So always one of the biggest things is just trying to find the right people in your team um, so they can help excel um, those sort of aspects of the business to really push it forward so it doesn't need as much involvement from yourself. Um, so that's been a journey in itself, trying to find those correct people. Um, and yeah, we've developed over that over the last couple of years. And and now we've got a really good solid team of people, um, which is now allowing us to scale a lot quicker. Um, and everyone's sort of got their, their each individual department to, to really push and, um, and hit those targets. And what does that scale sort of look like? How are you sort of, um, or what's the growth growth plan over the sort of next two to three years? Yeah. So now we're on 150 properties, um, started this year we're on 130, um, uh, so we're scaling quite quick. Um, we put a lot of systems in place over last year, spent a lot more on money on marketing and sales. Um, so by the end of this year, we're looking to hit just over 200 units. Um, and then within the next sort of four years, we're looking to get to a thousand units. Mm -hmm. And just on the marketing piece, obviously you're one of the uh, gold partners for uh, the Property Developer yes. Show, yeah. uh, which will be, this episode will be out Friday and the, the show will be the following Wednesday. So, yep. um, and you, you are talking at the event as well, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to that. It should be really good. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll probably delve, people will be able to get more detail on the intricacies of obviously how um, service accommodation works for sure. Yeah. From a property developer perspective, because I know you've obviously, you've, you've operated um, projects and um, you've done some creative lease options as well. Yes. Um, let's sort of delve into to that, that world for, for you. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, no, I've got um, two purchase lease options. Um, one of the biggest purchase lease options I did was a 10 bed HMO. Um, so jumping off sort of the SA side um, where we've agreed a purchase price um, for 500,000 um, and looking to get a refinance on it, probably, um, well, a proper valuation on it uh, end of this year, start next year for about 700,000. Um, it's a 10 bed at the moment generating between 65 to 70 K a year, um, revenue. Um, and on that one we had to do, we did spend about 50 K on a full refurb at the property. Wow. Um, it was obviously it had all the main structures. It already had it. It was already a HMO. So it had full licensing. So it had the main, um, sort of structure as in all the fire doors and all the regulations. So it's just mainly an internal full refurb. And what's, the sort of key to getting that type of deal then what what how did you come about that and then obviously um going from the pre-stage meeting with the vendor to then obviously delivering on you know such a profitable deal yeah so to be honest it's quite a a random one but everyone seemed to keep talking about purchase lease options all the time um so i thought i'd best look at some purchase lease options <laughs> and um so I was just mentioning it to a few people and this landlord in particular, I've got some rent to rent with him. Um, he wanted to sell off his portfolio over the next five years. This one property 
obviously the 10 bed, but he had like it, two rooms tenanted because he needed a full refurb. He didn't want to refurb himself. Um, he knew what he wanted for it, whether it was now or in a few years time. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously for capital gains tax, um, he wanted to spread out those sales of the properties. So it's kind of a good situation for me to come in and ask like, well, this is a perfect purchase lease option, which everyone keeps talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so I offered it to him and we had a little bit of negotiating back and forth, um, managed to agree, agree a deal from it. Um, and yeah, over the last, at the time I thought this seemed a good deal. What's my worst case scenario? Um, could sort of break even. And I look at it sort of five years later and I'm like, well, it's four years later, um, nearly five years. And I'm like, I should have actually probably looked for more of these mm-hmm. over the last few years mm-hmm. because it's actually a really, if you can structure a deal correctly and obviously get one like this, um, it's a really good creative way um, to get the property with very little capital. Mm, absolutely. I think you benefit from the capital growth, which is yes. almost one of the most vital parts to investing in property is, is the capital growth. You know, if you add that into, obviously you've got net yield and, and capital growth, they're the main two elements. And if you're, you've not had to outlay that cash and then, you know, the market goes up within that five year period, you're benefiting from that capital growth without having the risk of actually owning the asset. And, yes. you, you know, you've not got any, uh, or you've got the liquidity because obviously it's a cash flowing asset, but then the, the capital growth, that's obviously where you're benefiting from it. And, um, yeah, one of them a year or one of them a month would be, uh, oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, I guess, um, yeah, hindsight's a great thing and, and obviously that's the the whole um sort of idea around I suppose improving your situation and learning as you go and I suppose on that point then what's sort of some of the biggest lessons that you've sort of learned within your sort of property career? Yeah, there's probably been many different um points that I've sort of learned over the last uh the last few years. Probably one of the big ones is is building up a team, putting in systems in place. Um, there's been quite a few lessons from that, like I say, building the correct team. Um, and then also like, it's more actually probably even on like the business side of things could have built a big management business, um, learning, um, about like finances, cash flow, um, and cash flow projections as well. So you can forecast that, especially being in, say, maybe the SA industry, uh, cash flow goes down in the winter and then, and then increase it over the summer. So you need to make sure you're factoring all of that in. And same even on the on the property development side, um, I think a lot of people always uh, naively think they're going to be making loads of cash flow initially, um, but you've got to, there's always more things that come up. So even on, say, the refurb that I did on that, uh, purchase lease option um, and I've actually still been doing stuff over the last few years as well there's still a few things that I want to do before uh, we actually purchase the property just to make make it a bit aesthetically nice on the outside of the building um, uh, such as like a new front door and fascias and stuff like that so but there's lots of little extra things that creep in um, which do you need obviously a contingent, contingency plan mm-hmm. um, to add um so yeah, I think a lot of people think they're going to make a lot more cash flow from day one, but these things take time. Um, so it doesn't happen straight away. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think obviously, like you said as well, with the capital value of these assets going up, but also it's even like, it's quite interesting. If I look at say, um, that HMO, what I was charging for rent five years ago, and now what we're charging for rent on a room, I know obviously they have gone up dramatically in the last 12 months, which is probably abnormal. But even if they had just gone up slightly every year, they've still gone up. So the cash flow is going to be a lot more in five years time or 10 years time. And that's when I feel like it starts to really pay off in property. Mm-hmm. It doesn't pay off initially, but it's all of that, but our long-term gain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's what it's about, isn't it? It's, it's investing for the long term. And I suppose subject to what strategy you're looking at, if you're looking at the cash flow inside of things like the rent to rent and, you know, the management side of things, then obviously that's, that is... Uh, day one cash flow you, yes you, you, you know you need operational cash flow to run a business yeah whereas from an uh, an investment and we we allude to this i've alluded to this on the podcast a few times you know the whole um wealth creation and wealth preservation and how they're obviously two very different things and yes. it's it's a lot of property people um you know the likes of yourself uh, myself 
we've got the operational side of it, which is the wealth creation side. And then typically we're investing that money into, you know, what can be wealth creation as well as wealth preservation. You know, for me, it's continuing the wealth creation, please. I'm, I'm only doing developments and flips. But for you, obviously, you're investing in SA units, HMOs, which obviously from a, a operational perspective, obviously it's still wealth creation, but it's not necessarily the type of creation that, you know, the management company gives yes. you yeah. because that is purely for operational profit. It's not for a long-term investment unless you sell the business. Then obviously yes. that's a different approach. But from a, a sort of wealth pres preservation perspective, people do getting into property, you think, oh, I need 10 buy-to-lets and I'm going to leave my job. Yep. How many buy-to-lets have you got? None. Right. Well, when do you want to leave your job? 12 months. Yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> Unless you've got a million quid to put yep. into 10 buy-to-lets, then obviously that you you will, but you probably wouldn't be working a job if you've got a million quid. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, I, I think that's a really good piece to sort of touch on there. And I think from the perspective of, I guess, the lessons really, if you want to try and pinpoint what you've just said down to three key bits of advice that you would give around I suppose that whole investing piece and going from the three units to bright in Brighton to obviously where you are today yeah definitely so yeah what one of the bits of advice so make sure you're tracking cash flow um and and tracking those finances so whether that's in the business or on a development um make sure you're hot on those finances basically um so because i know even many developers overrun on their costs so make sure you're really tracking those day in day out so you know exactly what that's going to cost you and if it's going to overrun make sure you've got that contingency in place um then second one i'd probably say um building the right team around you um and especially with, say, development, building the correct sort of um, building team uh, to make sure that you can get the development complete on time. And also same with obviously like legal, so solicitors, capital allowance surveyors, accountants, um, and all of these, having that sort of, as many people call it, the power team, um, but having that sort of right power team around you can save you thousands of pounds and save you a lot of time. Um, so that's really key. Um, and then third one, I'd probably say kind of sort of relates again, but making sure the deal actually stacks. Um, I know a lot of people that just want to jump into property, mm -hmm. um, because they feel like it's the right thing, but be patient. It's not a rush. Mm -hmm. You can like as i've said anyway but as we were just saying property is a long-term thing um and same even with business even with cash flow businesses they are quick as in to generate cash flow but then if you want to keep investing them and keep scaling them it's still a long-term thing so same again that could be over 10 15 years and so is property so look at finding the right deals don't just rush into something make sure you're actually happy with that deal um and if you've got any bad feeling about it then don't make an offer or pull out of it have you ever sort of been in that situation then when you've sort of looked at a deal maybe got a bit of a bad feeling about it or have you done any deals i suppose that you kind of on the fence and have probably turned out to be not as good as that you thought you once thought um yeah probably some uh um i've never actually done completed on any but i've been close to probably buying some where I thought actually this just doesn't add up mm -hmm. or have a bad feeling about this. There's too much actually refurb to spend on this. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was um, near like the river as well. Um, and then that concerned me more in the end. I started diving into it more. Obviously had a survey. Obviously the cellar gets flooded, but it was a bit of a concern still where actually the water was going up to towards the property. Right. Um, and as the floods have got even worse over the last few years, um, then I was thinking, yeah, actually. Dodge the bullet. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's just invest it somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Um, makes sense. On the flip side as well, I've had even then, I've managed to pull myself out of something or not even make an offer when then I've seen happen something good of it in the future. 
Um, like there was commercial conversion. It was just a small little conversion, commercial conversion. We had a flat upstairs. The downstairs could have been converted into another flat. Um, it'd been on the market for like a year and it was up for, I think it'd come down to like 170 and they were happy to take 170. Um, and then, so I was going to go for it and then they took it off the market so I didn't go for it. In the end, I thought actually, this has been on the market for a year. Why has it been on the market for a year? Mm -hmm. um, and I decided to not not go ahead with it. So they took it off the market and then they went, obviously did a title split, which is what I was going to do, and title split downstairs, made it another flat. They ended up selling then the upstairs flat for 170K. Oh, wow. Um, and then obviously had another two bed flat downstairs mm -hmm. um, and I think they sold out for another 120 grand. So they did exactly what I'd planned to do in the end their self. Mm -hmm. um, so that on the flip side, I wish I, that was one deal that I regret that I didn't do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hindsight though. Yeah. And absolutely. I'm sure you've missed uh, or you've walked away from deals like the flood yeah. risk deals that have saved your, your skin. So but it's yeah. the nature of the beast, isn't it? It's the, the numbers uh, or numbers game. It's, it's um yeah, it's doing the right thing at the time. And obviously yes. that, that's what you were presented with. And yeah, hindsight's a great thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. So in terms of, I suppose, the next five years in, from, I, I guess, a management business as well as your investing journey yeah. you know what does that sort of look like yeah absolutely so so obviously on the management side we're looking to scale that up to a thousand properties for the next five years um, four to five years and then probably from sometime late next year we'll be investing more back into property into building a, uh, our own portfolio doing probably some more developments um, and we might do developments to SA or to buy to let or to HMO whatever we feel stacked in the market at the time. Um, but I do enjoy the the holiday let route. Um, obviously, there's probably going to be some regulation, well, there is registration and stuff coming in this year. So depending where I buy those properties, depending where obviously what registration process we need to go through, et cetera. Mm. Um, but yeah, some sort of probably commercial conversions um, to holiday lets um, or even just converting some big holiday lets uh, that might need a full refurb. Um and trying to increase the value of it, pull some of the money back out and then have it as a more of a luxury hollow layer let. Makes sense. Going back to Josh as a youngster. Yeah. And um, doing that, f well, well, how old are you now? 25, 26? Yeah, 26, yeah. So going back to 20-year-old Josh, yep. just starting out in the whole service accommodation uh, world, what would, if you stood here now, what would you, what bits of advice would you give to, to that young individual? good question um probably biggest bits of advice would be to going back to one of the things earlier that was mentioned so tracking cash flow um really stay hot and involved like in the business so even some people themselves you get out of the business because I was building up a management business. Um, you need to stay really hot on like the reviews, make sure the property is a good quality. Um, don't just take like anything, make sure you're taking the right property for the business, not just for the money side of thing. Um, and yeah, and, and like I say, tracking the cash flow to make sure you can obviously e expand to grow a bit quicker. Um, and also probably look at the market. So actually more the business side of things, a bit quicker um we've actually really only pushed on marketing in the last 12 months um so most of us was all grown organically which is great um but if i'd actually spent money on marketing from day one we'd probably have double or triple our portfolio compared to what we have now Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's finding that balance, isn't it? The, yeah. You know, the, the front end costs of marketing, what that exactly looks like. And I think as well, since you, you know, five years ago, the the industry certainly evolved in a yes. way. People understand it a lot more. Um, there's more availability to, you know, software and social media and um, obviously the likes of yourself that have been doing it for five years now. And I think um, certainly over that period, I suppose, being at the forefront of what I'd imagine you probably were, you know, one of the first uh, sort of at the forefront of the industry, one of the first people, you know, not in the UK to do it, but certainly within the first 10% that have been doing service accommodation. I think it's finding that balance with um, where to spend that money 
um, whether it be on cars, obviously for like yourself, <laughs> um, or whether it be on the marketing side of it. And but it's finding the balance, isn't it? And what's the point in working hard and and not enjoying what you've you've earned, sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Hundred percent. So I suppose a horror story then, because everyone always talks about how great SA is and all the cash flow and this, that, and the other. What What's the the worst guest story that you've you've got? Guest story. Um... Because I mean, the, many rare... the, 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 the Brighton story is pretty, um, it, it's going to take a lot to top that, to be honest. That, that's... Yeah. And so, so if, well, we can talk about another horror story in a minute, but I'd say that's more of a, that was more of a horror story on the situation, but it wasn't a guest fault. So right, if, right. if we go, if we go for, a, for a guest, we haven't, we haven't, to be honest, we haven't had too many horror stories from guests. Um, we learned very early on to make sure we're taking deposits, terms, and conditions, IDs, etc. Um, but one of the ones I can think going back to was um, a cleaner arrived at a property one morning and just sent me a photo of the door boarded up, um, and I was like, "Oh, great!" So, and this is just a cheap PVC door, so obviously it is pretty easy to put through. Um, but just the middle of the whole door frame, just with a board in it. Wow. Okay. Um, and I was like, oh, how do we get in the property then? Um, so I um, said, call a number on it or whatever anyway. So I doubt, uh, well, I think we're cleaning, call a number. And then I went to the police station and asked them. And the person had been arrested, but basically, um, two people had gone back to the property, ended up having a scrap, and one of them put each one through the door. Oh wow! Um, Jeez. So literally, <laughs> the whole door frame was gone through. Um, so that was quite an interesting one. So the guy did. Um, uh, he was. He did admit guilty to criminal damage. So obviously, it was repaired for, and he paid for it all. Um, but it was more of an inconvenience, and mm, absolutely. definitely a bit of a nightmare one. But so, that, so we haven't had too many from my actual guests. We've had lo loads of little things from guests of loads of just annoying damages mm -hmm. um probably a few hundred pounds but no like thousands of pounds of damages um but going to another horror story last year actually we had a basement property which was a rent to rent property um and for some reason one of our maintenance guys had gone in there literally just before somebody was checking in um and called me up and said the floor feels like a waterbed and I was like, okay, um, well, this is a bit strange. Maybe there is a leak somewhere or something like that. Looked around for it, couldn't find anything. And I was like, okay, well, um, we'll come back in a bit, see, see what see what the process is. Came back, I went back a few hours later. It was much more like a waterbed now. Pulled up the carpets and the, f the floor was completely flooded, like right up to the skirting boards. Um, then I called the landlord, he's in Barbados or something, and he said, oh, there, and I said, the floor is, it's not just a little bit of water, this is like just gushing, the whole flat now is absolutely soaked. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, this is not from like, because like, we thought initially it's from like the sunny flow or something, because um, obviously they can block up. They're always a nightmare, actually. Never get a property with a sunny flow. <laughs> Biggest recommendation. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I thought it could be that. Definitely wasn't that. Um, and then he said, oh, there is a manhole under the living room carpet. So we thought, oh, because it had been in absolute torrential weather at this time. So we thought, well, it's got to be coming from there. And so it's ripping up all of the carpet. Then obviously the floorboards underneath, but the water is literally, I don't know, five inches above the floorboards. So to chop the floorboards out, we've got like a, obviously electric saw, but then you're getting water all in it. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> so <laughs> trying to pump the water out as well. Um, with obviously a pump system to get, to get, so we can actually chop at the floorboards um, and get all the membrane out as well um, to get to this manhole. And we couldn't, we didn't even know where it was as well. He didn't know where it was, just somewhere under his living room floorboards. Um, eventually get to it. But the problem was that it was actually like a hole in the uh, 
in the uh, manhole so and the water had backed up from the council um, the council drains and basically flooded the whole apartment so um, oh, wow. it caused yeah loads of damage um, managed to eventually pump all the water out but it took a good week or something like that to for obviously all the drains to unblock and extra everything etc um, and then he obviously managed to sort out everything for the council in the end um, but it was just a bit chaos for a good few days jesus and it's all about the uh yeah the the, the, the good side of prophecy that yes. often uh, you see on social media but there's certainly um there's certainly <laughs> headaches out there yeah. if you're uh, operating it particularly at a scale you know 150 units you're, you're yep. bound to get stuff going wrong it's 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 almost a guarantee and if if things aren't going wrong maybe your systems aren't right to understand right exactly <laughs> what is going wrong or you're, you're definitely missing something yes. because yeah if um yeah if you're not making mistakes you're certainly not trying hard enough yeah. but it's uh yeah madness absolute madness some of these stories and i think they're quite tame versus some of the stuff i've i've heard across yep. the board but you know on the flip side of that obviously it is a great business model it produces a good income for people it's good it's you know a great business to get into particularly if you've got no sort of prior experience sort of similar to yourself yeah i mean obviously it's evolved a lot since you were doing it five years ago but there's still opportunity out there to you know do it better than someone else is doing it or offer a unique service that you know is not offered in the same way and i think yeah there's definitely um a great sort of operational business model particularly if you're trying to keep that property theme going yes yeah 100 percent. good stuff so i think um to round the podcast up quite nicely then um what bit of advice would you give to the listeners that are maybe thinking about service accommodation yeah so if it's obviously on um a development side um or anything uh from either side but especially ours this is obviously a development podcast um I think there's a big opportunity out there still for developers to build more like a, a part hotel block um, and make it obviously more customized to the industry, um, like making sure you've got like sort of cupboards as well throughout the building. So in the hallway, so obviously the, you can hold like say linen stock there and supplies for like the cleaners. So then you can cut down on your costs to actually like employ a cleaner directly. Um, that makes it much more logistically easier as well. Obviously, if you have it in like a block of 10, because we do have some like blocks like that. Um, and then obviously improve the spec of the properties as well. So um, if you're going to save, I don't know, especially if you're developing it, when you're doing it from scratch, it could be literally an extra couple of thousand pounds to spend on each apartment. Um, and it's worth just spending that little bit of extra money, going that little bit of extra high end, because if I look, that's probably one of the biggest things that I'd say has changed over the industry over the last six years. There's been obviously a load more supply coming into the market and the spec now has gone up a considerable amount. So obviously we've all got to compete. So making sure Really, if you're going into this market, it's not just an investment. It actually is a business as well. So even if you're a developer and obviously norm, normal, normally you get to do maybe buy to let or something with them. If you want to do SA with them instead slash holiday lets, then you got to think, well, what is this customer clientele going to be? Who is my ideal customer? And what are they going to want? All of the extra amenities, et cetera. Um, and how's that going to they stay sustainable for the next five to 10 years? Whereas obviously a buy to let, you're just going sort of more bog standard. Um, Cause it might even just be like color themes of the property, or you might add some like paneling on the walls and stuff like that to make it stand out more. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going down the SA route. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. That's a good bit of advice. It basically creates something unique yes, and specific 100%. to, um, from a logistics perspective but as well as from a i suppose a creative perspective in a sense of getting guests to actually yes. stay at the house yeah like, absolutely good. happy days good round off there so if people want to get in touch with with you instagram facebook where's the best place yeah 100 percent. so facebook obviously josh guest um just drop me a message on there or Instagram underscore Josh underscore guest underscore. Um, nice and easy. If you're just putting Josh guest on Instagram, I'm sure I'll uh, pop up. Um, yeah, drop me a message on there. I'm always happy to help out of anyone. Cool. And a, and a big massive plug. Obviously, if you want to speak to Josh directly, visit the show uh, next Wednesday. Yep, 100%. Uh, May the 1st uh, in Birmingham at the Hawthorne Stadiums. Obviously, uh, Josh will be talking as well. So be going 
into more detail around the service accommodation and uh, certainly be insightful. And, and Josh will be on the expert panel at the end of the day as well. Brilliant. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on today. It's been a pleasure to unpick the journey, so to speak. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming over. No worries. Thanks for having me, Scott. Great stuff. So thanks to all the listeners today. Uh, hopefully you've got some value from this, particularly if you are looking to invest in service accommodation. Uh, obviously, uh, Josh is a great guy to follow in terms of uh, that journey and understanding what really goes into uh, owning and operating a service accommodation business. So if you're listening on YouTube, please do leave a like and subscribe. And if you're listening on the audio version, please do leave a review. It certainly helps podcasts. I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Goodbye.